The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. A huge welcome to everybody who's listening from across the world to this UK IBC webinar in partnership with FICI and Kingstub and Casiva. And today we're going to be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the Indian economy. And my name's Chris Hayes. I'm one of the directors at UK IBC. And first and foremost, I hope that you are all safe and taking the advice and guidance of your own government to protect your health and those of our vital care workers during this difficult times. Our thoughts and prayers are with the one million people worldwide who are battling the virus at the present time, including the Prime Minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, and of course the families of those 82,000 people who have so far died. Let's hope the collaboration and cooperation of business, universities and society will continue long after this virus has gone to help address some of the other challenges we face globally. Uh, this webinar is one of a, a number of webinars that we're doing and the UK IBC is taking steps to ensure that our networks are kept as up to date as possible with the key business and government issues that are facing and coming out of COVID-19. Um, our next webinar is on the 16th of April and we'll look at university social responsibility and how universities are playing a vital role in taking dialogue on key issues to implementation. Details of that will be sent out shortly to enable you to register for that. Also, please feel free to, to join us on Twitter. You can see on the screen, our Twitter handle is at UKIBC. You can also see that Fiki India's uh, Twitter handle is on there as well. And of course, uh, Kingstub and Kaseva are on LinkedIn as well. So feel free to join their group. You can also log on to our website for our newsletter, which goes out on a monthly basis. And you will also find our previous webinars that are on there, which include topics such as protecting your IP in India, employment legislation, and of course, the recent updates, the bankruptcy and insolvency code. But before we start, just some housekeeping. You will all be automatically placed on mute. So if you have any questions, you will notice on the side of your panel there is a questions section. Please feel free to add any questions that you want any time during the presentation and they'll be coming through to me and I'll be able to ask those on your behalf at the end of the session. You will also be glad to know that we are recording the session. So this will be on our website as of tomorrow and you will receive that link and to enable you to look at it in case there are any sections that you want to re-listen to. Uh, we have a great lineup today and I'm delighted to first introduce to you uh, Mr. Dilip Chinoy, General Secretary at FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Uh, Dilip has been the Secretary General now at FICI for over two years and as I'm sure you'll know, FICI is the voice of Indian business and industry from influencing policy to encouraging debate, engaging with policy makers and civil society, Fiki articulates the views and concerns of industry. Uh, Dilip, I know you've got a, an excellent presentation to talk about some of the surveys that you've been doing. So um, over to you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris, and uh, good morning to those in the UK and you know, good afternoon to people this side of the world. Uh, I want to echo uh, Chris's sentiment about uh, Hope that you're all safe and keeping safe, uh, keep safe, keep indoors. Um, and um, our thoughts and prayers are also with all your families and your extended organizations, uh, wherever they be in the world. So I want to first begin by thanking UK IBC for partnering in this initiative. Um, I think this is a great way uh, to communicate. Uh, I see that there are already 243, 44 participants uh, on, online. Um, I think my presentation, what I'll try to do is cover it briefly. Uh, one is, you know, the COVID-19, what is the global crisis? What are global forecasts? What's the Indian forecast? What's the impact in different sectors? And then second, which will be slightly in overlap with the next presentation, uh, measures initiated by government in India to address this, uh, you know, further uh, recommendations by FIKI. And then results of a FICI survey in India on the impact of COVID and how it actually has uh, rolled out. And then uh, end with uh, what FICI is doing to help uh, members 
in this uh, initiative. So if I um, go to the next slide. Okay. So um, I have, um, okay. So the, if we look at globally, you know, the, the, initially the, uh, the, uh, till February 10th or something like that, the, it was in China. Now you see the US graph uh, kind of uh, exponentially growing. The other hotspots, uh, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, UK also has uh, 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 a rising graph. And India has been uh, not that many numbers, but um, I think uh, still is a cause of concern. And if you look at uh, the different uh, revised grow, uh, forecasts for countries around the world, uh, many are in negative uh, area and China and India are still holding up uh, a little bit, but it de depends on how far and how long and how extensive this uh, outbreak is. Um, if you look again, um, it's really uh, a health uh, crisis also. And uh, if you look at health expenditure as a percentage of GDP, India is 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 uh, is much lower than other countries. Uh, in the global health security uh, index, uh, you know, we are at 46.5, uh, uh, and um, you know, I think what we are actually seeing here is also the proportion of uh, people above 65 in country in India is actually lower. So, uh, and also because services a significant uh, share of uh, in GDP, the, you know, cutting down uh, and lockdown has actually uh, helped in, you know, controlling the numbers in India. Of course, everybody uh, from Moody's to Crystal to Standards and Poor, uh, India ratings and Fitch uh, have uh, given latest uh, forecasts. The only thing which is sure about this that they will be revised every week, depending upon the uh, lockdown. So uh, you know you actually have uh, uh, demand, supply, and 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 you know kind of uh, production, and um, the impact uh, on uh, industry has been multifold. Initially, in the early uh, days of uh, February. Uh, the whole thing was uh, imports of APIs and imports of solar panels, et cetera. But now we have a different set of uh, challenges going forward. If you look at the different sectors, which is the uh, third part uh, of the first part of the presentation, we look at tourism and aviation actually is shut down, right? It's total, totally uh, shut down. Aviation is only running specific cargo flights but the, there are no international flights coming in, only international cargo is alive. There's absolutely no international or domestic tourism. The media and entertainment industry is shut down. You can't even film for new releases on television or Netflix or you know uh, Amazon Prime or Z or whatever the channels are. Uh, retail is uh, closed, only essential retail and groceries are open. So there is a huge challenge there. Consumer durables, uh, again impacted. So what we are seeing is that uh, in the short term, you had uh, online healthcare, e-commerce, uh, personal care, online entertainment, uh, you know, subscriptions, and online media actually growing. So there were some sectors who actually uh, uh, actually grew and will keep this momentum because this is now becoming the new norm in the way people are consuming these services. Some others like food, Telecommunications, utility services, uh, retail, pharmacy, pharmaceuticals have spiked in the short term and maybe will last for about six to nine months. And of course, a number of things which are hit in the short term, which is apparels, beverages, insurance, agriculture, chemicals, mining and metals services, are uh, in uh, hit in 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 the uh, short term and will hopefully uh, recover in the long uh, term. But there are some sectors which are hit in the short term and will take from 12 to 24 months to recover, including restaurant and food services, 
transportation and tourism, logistics uh, because uh, of different reasons, entertainment and education, which is offline, you know, and a whole lot of auto ancillaries, uh, real estate and consumer uh, durables. So Vicky had also done a survey and uh, a lot of people, uh, like uh, nearly 61 uh, percent uh, felt that uh, the, or actually 81 percent felt it would be very high to moderate and only 9% uh, said very low and 10% said low. And it, it actually goes back to the sectors that I just talked about. Everybody, 73% uh, actually felt that there's going to be impact on order book. Really 8% uh, look is going to be increased. These were pharma and online delivery, et cetera. Um, cash flow, significant portion felt is going to be a problem. And 63% uh, uh, at that time felt the supply chain was impacted uh, due to the COVID pandemic. I think this number will go up because uh, it is uh, really uh, changing as we, uh, uh, since the time we did the survey. So uh, the government of India and RBI announced uh, relief measures. Uh, the first one was on the, 20, uh, uh, on the 24th uh, of March where the finance minister announced uh, uh, procedural changes in terms, and this is covered very well in the next presentation, so I will not uh, talk about it. They also announced a $1.7 trillion stimulus package for the economically weaker and vulnerable sec uh, sec sections in terms of direct benefit transfer, uh, replenishment of uh, gas used by women, support to self-help groups, uh, support uh, you know, uh, to uh, elderly people, support to pensioners, and support to women. So that was the whole uh, package there. They also said they'll front load the direct uh, benefit uh, transfers to the farm uh, sector. The third uh, set uh, really came in by RBI on the next day, which talked about reducing the repo rate. Uh, industry is not very happy with this, but actually in the current scenario, interest rate chains will not make such a difference uh, other than you know the banks were permitted to allow three month monitorium for EMI payments on term loans, et cetera. They did not talk about any interest uh, halt at the moment. And of course they talked about LTRO operations to improve liquidity and the cash reserve ratio to again uh, to improve liquidity. Then the uh, trade related uh, measures came on the 31st of March. Uh, which included uh, incentives for goods exports and uh, all of that. So on the on, on the right hand side of the slide, we actually said you know which were the uh, the key suggestions considered by government and RBI fully and uh, partially. Um, there is um, a full set of further recommendations from Fiki, uh, which are with uh, the prime minister and with the finance minister, a lot of people in the government and. Mr. Ranade has really helped us in uh, you know, formulating a lot of this, so he may talk about this later. Um, first is really what was done for the one point, uh, you know, uh, for the in the first tranche for the bottom of the pyramid. I think the understanding was that the lockdown may continue for a specific period, but the impact is longer, so we need money to be injected for relief and rehabil rehabilitation across all levels. We are looking at setting up a revival fund, uh, which will promote scientific research and create self-sufficient industry clusters with value chains for products where India has high import dependence, and then look at uh, phased opening up of the economy and restarting growth, uh, fundamentally dividing India into different zones, uh, looking at the patients and uh, moving outwards, so red where there are currently increasing cases, yellow where the only active cases and new cases and green where there are absolutely no cases and there's no history. So open up economic activity in the green in a phased manner uh, also uh, and different strategies for the yellow and red and get everybody to move from first from red to yellow and then yellow to green uh, there. And um, the demand side uh, interventions also have been listed out on the slide. Uh, a lot of agriculture food grain to be released. Uh, again, uh, more uh, funds transferred to state to supplement their efforts to cater to the immediate needs of the poor. 
and need to accelerate infrastructure spend of 1.7 lakh crores. It's very interesting. There was a story from Telangana that you know they they're focused on completing the flyovers because there's no traffic on the road. So you know uh, there is a, there is a flip side to this also. And then you know for ensuring food security in the future, look at agriculture warehousing and cold uh, storages. There are other sets of uh, recommendations from Fiki about interest fee collaterals for MSME companies uh, for a period of 12 months. I think the uh, loan which has been announced, waiver which has been announced by RBI should be made a directive. Uh, we need to change the NPA definition and the payment of statutory reduce uh, deferred by six months. Non-cashing of bank guarantees and, and corporate guarantees, et cetera, should be there. The government owes industry a lot of money, so that should be cleared uh, there. And of course, a special liquidity line to NBFCs from banks because the NBFCs are real backbone on the Indian economy. And uh, then balance cost of banks refinancing, help manage cost of uh, uh, the other activities that the banks do. So the banks will have to be the center of this, but the banks cannot be allowed. Uh, banks also need to be supported going forward. So what we are doing with members, and this is my last slide, we're working members of the healthcare industry to ramp up availability of beds, uh, protective equipment, uh, ramp out production of sa masks, sanitizers, uh, personal protective equipment, overalls, etc. And then uh, help new members uh, from the auto sector and other sectors, uh, defense sectors to produce ventilators. We are also doing a lot of work under socioeconomic development by survival kits, uh, provision of cooked meals, uh, working with medical equipment do uh, donation, working with vulnerable households by direct transfer kitchens, setting up uh, transfers, setting up community kitch kitchens. And Fiki has also contributed one day salary uh, to uh, the fund. But what was very interesting, we appointed Fiki nodal offices in each state for facilitating, uh, for facilitating the movement of essential commodities. Uh, to ensure that inter-district uh, movement happens. And uh, we really worked between, uh, acted as a link between suppliers and, and, and buyers on essential commodities, including uh, uh, medical equipment. We also did a continuum of goods and services under essential categories and sh shared it and you know, worked with it. And of course, uh, uh, we created a link with the state government nodal officers. And, you know the, all the recommendations that we just shared with you we flag those and share this with government uh, to enable the constant dialogue uh, to uh, happen you know one interestingly one of the most uh, well received things was you know in the initial stage of the lockdown no newspapers were going so we sent a lot of members an e-paper tying up with one of the newspapers and actually that's what got us a lot of things because people were not getting uh, authentic uh, news so I thought I'll stop here, and this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me, and we'll take questions whenever uh, they are scheduled. So thank you, Philip. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think that was a you know a very um, insightful introduction um, to that. I think it was quite interesting to to hear about those areas where um, the acceleration of obviously infrastructure development, uh, particularly in terms of the coal storage. Uh, which I know is something that um, India has been trying to look at for, for a long time. So some, some uh, green shoots coming out from that. I think it was also interesting to see your presentation on, on the 2% growth that is forecast. Um, I was on a presentation uh, a couple of days ago, um, other economists are talking about 0% to 2%. So I'm looking forward to our, our conversation uh, later on uh, to look at that. Just as a reminder to everybody, um, you are able to ask any questions during the presentations um if you tap into your question panel on the right and what we'll do is we'll save all those questions and we'll build all those up for the end q a session and uh, next we're going to start to look at some of those um government initiatives that have been put out in a, a little bit more detail and look at some of those practical um examples of what's happening to businesses um, so it's been my great pleasure to introduce Jidesh kumar who is the managing partner of one of the UK IBC members at King Stubb and Kaseva. They are advocates and attorneys in India. They have a full service legal practice with six offices in India, including cities like New Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, Chennai, Hyderabad, and Kashi. 
and also uh, uh, an international office that's based in Milan, Italy. So no doubt they all have had some direct experience of uh, some of the challenges from that office. Uh, GDS is working directly with a number of businesses in India during this crisis, and we're delighted that he's agreed to share his thoughts and knowledge on the issue. Uh, so Jidesh, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, for uh, to all the participants uh, uh, for being able to um, uh, join this uh, COVID presentation. Um, I hope all of you are safe and uh, healthy, and uh, as the government has recommended, and as and as uh, recommended earlier by the presenta presenters, please stay at home. And I think that's very important to ensure that uh, uh, the government controls this uh, in, a, in a better uh, fashion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus um, has uh, brought forth with it a lot of challenges, uh, especially uh, to the government of India as well as to the citizens. And one of the primary challenges uh, for the government is uh, firstly to ensure that people stay at home. And now when people stay at home, it's also important for the government to ensure that there is no shortage of uh, essential goods and services. And when um, there is a requirement for essential goods and services, there's also a requirement to ensure that there are enough incentives as well as um, enough uh, uh, um, space available for manufacturing and services company who provide essential goods and services as well as uh, supply chain companies in uh, this space. So my presentation would uh, encounter uh, three different aspects. The first would be the response uh, to the COVID uh, virus um, by the government. Uh, the second would talk about response by the various courts and tribunals in India. And the third uh, would uh, probably be those unanswered issues to the um, companies and uh, manufacturing and services com businesses across uh, India and the world. So at the move to the uh, steps taken by the government, uh, different uh, departments, different ministries of uh, the government have uh, come together and have uh, um, laid down different uh, regulations and uh, they um, issued uh, you know, different orders uh, for uh, the benefit of uh, companies during this time. I think one of the uh, leaders when it comes to uh, issuing uh, relaxations was the Ministry of uh, Corporate Affairs. Uh, Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, has uh, extended the dates for filing of annual company returns and other uh, um, uh, statements and returns uh, to September 2020 as against uh, the original date uh, of uh, 31st of uh, March uh, 2020. Also uh, extending, um, um, also, also in order to support new companies um, there is a mandatory declaration of commencement of business that needs to be filed within um, a certain period of time. And this is now extended to 12 months from the date of incorporation. So newer companies get that much extra time in order uh, to file such uh, declarations. Um, a very interesting uh, um, um, uh, regulation that came about was relaxing the rules on video conferencing. The board meetings can now be held via video conferencing. Um, the government also has come out with an interesting scheme called the Companies Fresh Start Scheme 2020, along with um, uh, another scheme called the Limited Liability Partnership Settlement Scheme. So these schemes provide opportunities for new companies, uh, um, for uh, existing companies and LLPs. Uh, to take advantage of uh, the scheme. The, um, um, the government regulations, uh, the MC, MCA relaxations also extend uh, to um, also providing 
for uh, extension of uh, time for uh, board meetings. So what used to be a mandatory uh, requirement um, requirement of holding board meetings within a uh, within a prescribed interval, this has now been extended to an additional uh, 60 day period for the next two quarters. Also, independent directors of the companies are now not mandated to hold the meeting of independent directors for the financial year 2019-20. So what it meant, what it means is that company independent directors were supposed to hold meetings without the executive directors. And now um, during this period, they can hold these meetings along with the executive uh, directors. So that technically means that this particular provision stays annulled for this uh, year. Also, um, one more relaxation which uh, the Ministry of Company Affairs has come come, up, come about uh, is uh, the requirement of a mandatory Indian resident director. So this has now been exempted for the current year 2019-20. Um, the second uh, 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 step um, taken by the government was uh, um, done by the Insolvency Board of India. And this has uh, extended the threshold of default uh, under the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code uh, from Indian rupees 1 lakh to Indian rupees 1 crore. So this is to ensure micro, small and medium enterprises do not become insolvent and their vendors or their financial creditors or their operational creditors do not approach the NCLT for claims against them till such time the um, government comes with a notification either reducing uh, this uh, amount of rupees one crore or uh, till such time um, the uh, 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 the government comes with uh, any other additional notification, either reducing or increasing this sum. The third uh, the interesting uh, step taken by the government is vis-a-vis -vis the banking and finance uh, uh, on the on the banking and finance front. So, Reserve Bank of India has been in the forefront of these things along with uh, the Ministry of Finance. The 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 first major thing is. Uh, and the Reserve Bank of India and the Ministry of Finance has reduced the bank charges for digital trade transactions for trade finance consumers. Um, the second one has uh, is to um, bring about a repayment moratorium for three months on all term loans. It also has uh, extended the date of collection of stamp duty through the stock exchanges and clearing corporation of India till July 1st, 2020. And uh, as uh, the earlier presenter said, uh, the in interest in working capital has uh, also been deferred to three months. The government also has taken steps um, with respect to direct and indirect taxes, where uh, government has extended the due dates of filing of uh, uh, GST forms, EVA bills, and Sapka Vishwas scheme. And these are extended to June and July 2020 on the basis of uh, the taxpayers' aggregate turnover. So for companies um, having turnover of um, less of more than five crores, the due dates of filing is 24 June. So they are probably the earliest. And for companies beyond um, having turnovers of less than five crores, uh, the dates get extended to 30th and 6th, 3rd and um, 30th of July on, um, uh, on, on, uh, on the basis of their aggregate turnover. The direct tax, day, um, the dates for filing of income tax returns and linking of other numbers have has also been extended. And in all cases, it has been extended to June 30th, 2020. One um, important um, step which the government has taken is uh, the is in extending the deadline for realization and repatriation period of export proceeds. So this uh, technically makes all um, foreign uh, all pay all foreign payments um, 
to be extended from nine months to 15 months. So this also helps the customers in foreign countries and uh, also helps Indian software companies as well as manufacturing uh, companies and other exporters to renegotiate the contracts um, and extend the contracts with their uh, customers. SEBI has also been in, um, for, in the forefront um, during the coronavirus times and has uh, extended the dates of filing of forms for listed companies, mutual funds, real estate and infrastructure investment trusts, alternative investment funds, venture capital funds, etc. And uh, these have been extended to May, June and September depending on the kind of company that you are. The government has also um, been forefront when it uh, comes to employee benefits. Uh, the government has taken the initiative to contribute the entire 24% um, to the Employment Provident Fund for the next three months. Also, the date of receipt of employment state insurance has been extended to 30 days. And uh, the government has also issued advisory to employers to not terminate workers. There has also been advisory to landlords to not terminate housing tenancy due to inability to pay. This has also been reiterated by the ministers, the chief ministers of various states on television almost on a daily basis. And there is also an advisory to disperse wages on time. The Disaster Management Department, the Ministry of Home Affairs, has uh, been regularly issuing uh, notifications, clarifications, press notes in order to uh, ensure that uh, there is no uh, roadblock to essential goods and service providers. So there has been uh, multiple times uh, the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs have tried to define what's an essential goods and have also issued clarification and what forms the supply chain of producers of essential goods and services. There are, there are also states which come out with their own uh, amendments to these. Uh, the state government also has, uh, of, uh, of various states in India, have also laid down procedures for issuance of passes and permits to operate um, 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 also uh, passes for labor and also uh, passes for uh, transportation. Uh, while in some states uh, there are uh, online um, forms available, online passes available, in other states you have to do it offline, but uh, there is uh, uh, a definite momentum towards uh, online uh, passes. I think uh, that's a positive step for business. Next, I move to the steps taken by courts and tribunals. I think the biggest step uh, that was taken was uh, by the Supreme Court of India, where it used uh, the powers provided to it under Article 142 of the Constitution and has extended limitation periods of all appeals to the Supreme Court from high courts or tribunals till further orders to be passed by the Supreme Court. And the good part about this order is that it does not mention a last date, so which keeps it open-ended and the Supreme Court will review the situation on a regular basis and will pass a, a relevant order as and when it deems fit after consultation with the executive. With respect to urgent matters, there are matters of liberty, there are matters of uh, um, urgency, which requires urgent attention, and uh, the high courts and supreme courts are capable are, and are empowered and are also currently taking up matters through video hearings. In fact, um, I just finished a video hearing just before attending this uh, conference call. Uh, on the insolvency and uh, company matters, um, the, the National Company Law Appellate, Appellate Tribunal as well as the uh, National Company Law Tribunal have both allowed exclusion of the period of lockdown to calculate the period of resolution process. So there is some kind of a moratorium on that. And um, it also stays uh, all the orders passed by the tribunals till the next date of hearing. Having said this, 
the NCLT has also been a little more flexible and has said that if there are any orders or interim stays which really affects the business operations of the company, then it is uh, open to hear such matters. Now I move to the last part of my presentation, which is uh, the open issues for companies. So as a law firm partner and as a lawyer, I see that these are some of the issues which are really keeping us busy, which technically also means that these are the major issues which are confronting companies at this point of time. I think the, the first and foremost one is uh, interpretation of post measure and frustration of contract the clauses uh, for business vendors and lease agreements we've seen that in most of the agreements either force measure or frustration of contract is not does not contemplate such kind of a pandemic or epidemic or even a disaster and even if uh, they are considered they are only from the perspective of termination of a contract now in this situation where nobody intends to terminate the contract the law also provides for certain doctrines the doctrine of suspension the doctrine of temporary frustration the doctrine of improbability and also the doctrine of peaceful possession so these are all doctrines that needs to be read along with the situation provided for in the agreement before companies take decisions to either ask for a waiver or ask for deferment or ask for extension or any other uh, mixed uh, strategies that could be thought of. The government, uh, while having um, issued certain notifications and advisories, has not defined what is a worker it does not define what is a migrant worker and it does not define what is an employee the reason is that some of the notifications uses the term migrants or workers so it doesn't use the word migrant workers so there's a lot of uh, confusion there and the term workers is uh, not defined in in some primary legislations rather the terms used is workmen so there is a confusion when uh, the word workers comes in uh, guidelines. Another um, um, issue which companies would probably be facing is the effect of imposition of advisories on companies, uh, especially companies that are not, uh, or businesses that are not financially sound. Uh, considering that this is an advisory, and also considering the fact that this is an advisory which is passed under the Disaster Management Act, there are various schools of thought. One school of thought is that since this is only an advisory, it should not be deemed as a, um, a legal position, and hence there is no obligation on the companies. There is also the other school of thought which says that since this is passed under the Disaster Management Act, there is uh, a mandatory requirement for companies to follow this well we are also recommending companies to jointly um, file a writ before their courts before the high courts or the supreme court to seek clarity because without clarity many companies which are not financially sound and do not have uh, uh, fundraising strategies would uh, either become defunct or will have to close down and will impose onerous liability on the promoters and directors and shareholders of the company. The other issue that we are facing currently, or the companies that are facing currently is data privacy and cyber, cyber security risk during work from home. The Department of Telecommunication has uh, uh, come out with uh, notifications stating that uh, um, all um, companies can now use uh, technologies to work from home. However, um, when it comes to data privacy and cybersecurity, there are no regulations which go on. So companies will have to put down strict data privacy laws and cybersecurity uh, policies in order to ensure that uh, 
the COVID-19 virus time or the coronavirus time does not lead to uh, litigations for them after uh, the end of this uh, uh, catastrophe. We've also seen that uh, when it comes to mergers and acquisition and investment transactions, there are um, companies who are looking at either um, invoking the material adverse change or have already invoked material adverse effect uh, clauses uh, and are rethinking valuations. So these are also uh, um, um, issues that uh, companies might be facing. One of the uh, important things that companies should probably be looking at right now is reworking on employment agreements, especially policies and processes to include supervision and managerial responsibilities to avoid labor loss. We've seen that there are some employment positions where there are supervision and managerial roles to a clerical job. So those um, were not included and hence they are now um, required to comply with labor laws. So I'm also seeing a lot of uh, inquiries on companies wanting to rework the employment uh, agreements. Uh, fortunately, um, the government is looking at uh, providing economic incentives to the government. However, it is still in the government's boundary at this point of time. Uh, the other issue which I think companies could probably be facing is uh, emergency fundraise. So it's important for uh, companies to also ensure that they do not fall into uh, deep traps and uh, uh, provide uh, uh, I and mean, take loans on at high interest rates. So I think all of these needs to be uh, considered by companies. Yeah. So uh, these are the points that I had to cover, and uh, I now. Uh, uh, and, and this is the probably the last slide of my presentation, and I now uh, uh, um, give it to Chris uh, to take it up further. From Perfect. Me. Thank you so much, Desh. I think that was an extremely interesting overview of those those initiatives that the Indian government has come, uh, and it does uh, pose a, a number of questions that I've got, which I'll, I'll put to you all to it all to the end. Um, and then finally, we've got our third panelist, um, and I'm it's delighted. Are you sorry? Hi, Ajit. Yes, I'm delighted to introduce Ajit Randon, the chairman of FICI uh, Economist. He's the sorry, he's the chairman of the FICI Economist Forum, and he's the president and chief economist of Elita Bala Group, the Indian multinational conglomerate. His professional career career has spanned academic and corporate assignments, including teaching in universities in the India and the US, as well as serving on various committees of the Reserve Bank of India. He's also a member of the National Executive Committee on FICI. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your commentary, uh, Ajit, on the sort of Indian economy and your thoughts. So over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you perfectly. Great. So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes to uh, talk about the effect of the COVID uh, a pandemic on India and currently we are in the middle of a 21 day national lockdown. So the immediate effect of the lockdown is almost three quarters of the economy is practically shut. Uh, companies are shut, businesses are shut, factories are shut down, uh, services, restaurants, everything. Uh, just a few, few highlights uh, for your concentration uh, as, as what's happening in the current situation, you know. 87% uh, of the rural workforce and 53% of the urban worker, workforce uh, workers are self-employed or what is called unorganized sector. So uh, these are people who typically have uh, are depend on da daily wages or uh, livelihoods which are very precarious. Uh, many Indian cities have 40 to 60% of migrant populations. So because of the lockdown, uh, they have been caught uh, with uh, great stress on their livelihoods or their incomes. So many uh, migrants have chosen to in fact, uh, go back or like a reverse migration uh, to their to their villages. And that's, that's, that's been a bit of a disruption, although that was the initial case, but now I think uh, it's stabilized. Uh, essential goods and services are, are permitted and progressively the government has been very responsive in uh, relaxing restraints on 
movement of uh, trucks and transport, especially to transport uh, goods and services, essential, including food. Uh, but we may be uh, having to uh, brace ourselves for a bit of an inflationary situation as far as food inflation is concerned or raw material shortages. 53% of Indian businesses have indicated that uh, there's going to be a big impact of COVID-19 on business operations. In fact, there was a FICI survey and 42% of the people said it will take up to three months for any normalcy to return. Energy consumption has declined by around 22% since the second week of March. Uh, eight states of uh, the most, most of the COVID cases are not distributed uniformly across India. So eight of the states which are uh, worst affected account for more 55% of India's GDP. Uh, and uh, let's go to the next slide. So what have the Indian policymakers done so far? Uh, we've had 1.7 trillion rupees of uh, worth of a fiscal package, which is basically direct income transfer, uh, food, of, uh, uh, food entitlement, food grain entitlement, wage increases in the rural employment guarantee scheme, which is uh, also like a proxy unemployment insurance, uh, advances or money transfer to farmers, and some contribution to uh, the retirement accounts of uh, workers, uh, low income uh, category. But even then, this fiscal stimulus is much smaller than uh, not just India's needs, but in comparison to other G20 countries, it amounts to 0.8% of GDP, whereas typically larger economies have done 8 to 10% of GDP. So I think much more is uh, likely to come in the next, in the coming days. On the other hand, the monetary authorities, uh, the monetary stimulus has been uh, quite significant. There's been a drastic reduction in interest rates and uh, there's been a huge injection of liquidity into the banking system, uh, almost to the tune of 4 trillion rupees. And there's been a moratorium on loan servicing. That is uh, no, no interest payments are due for next three months. Uh, what is the impact of all this? Uh, of course, the fiscal deficit uh, is going to be uh, stretched. Uh, it was already 4.5% of GDP before COVID. And uh, we, we expect, uh, of course, our tax revenues to also fall. However, there's a silver lining that uh, because of fall in crude oil prices, uh, the petrol and diesel prices in India have not fallen as much. And the, and the gain has gone to the government in terms of higher uh, sales tax excise duties. So that will help to sh at least meet some of the new fiscal commitments. And uh, of course, it, just like the central government, the state government, state finances will also be under strain. Uh, and all of these, the center and states will have to find ways to uh, stretch the fiscal deficit. I mean, there's a law which puts a cap of 3%. But in, in these times, perhaps uh, there will be an amendment. Uh, the last point is that the Reserve Bank of India has now started uh, injecting liquidity in a somewhat unconventional way. They call it the TLTRO, Targeted Long-Term Repo Operations, which are actually intended to help specific borrowers like uh, non-bank finance companies and housing finance companies who found it difficult because of a credit freeze. Uh, some of the longer term effects of this uh, is that, of course, we might, we might have we might see diversification of value chains, uh, people taking a view about uh, moving some of the production bases out of China or into countries like India and Vietnam. We'll also see a lot of unconventional fiscal and monetary policies, uh, such as uh, the central banks directly providing credit to the private sector. Uh, we could also see, uh, a, you know slow revival of consumer and business confidence, a huge increase in the healthcare spending across many economies, including India. And we also have to worry about uh, risk aversion uh, affecting emerging market currencies uh, and commodities such as India's. So as we stand today, uh, the Indian GDP growth rate for this year is still expected to be positive, perhaps 2%, plus 2%, when in fact, most of the world except China is uh, going to see GDP contraction, especially in this quarter, April to June. I believe that uh, large economies will see a contraction of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, India's GDP during this quarter also may sh see some shrinkage, but overall it will remain positive for this year. 
and uh, uh, as far as what is the estimate of how long it will take to come back to a normal situation it's difficult to say at least two or three months to in fact limp back to uh, uh, out of the lockdown and uh, the, the sectors which have been badly affected of course are travel tourism hotels restaurants hospitality but the other sectors like uh, pharma healthcare and consumer products essential goods and services they will return quickly uh, i believe automobile also should see some revival banking because 75% is in the is owned by the government and is in the public sector that also will see some support uh, airlines of course will take some time uh, i just heard that the singapore uh, Singapore uh, airport has decided, I mean, Singapore has decided that Terminal 2 will remain closed for the next 18 months. And that's a pretty uh, strong view to take on, on revival. So uh, I would say uh, to come back to about 6-7% GDP growth rate, it's going to take at least six to nine months. So we'll see. I think I'll stop there and maybe uh, we can take some questions. Yeah, thank you, Ajit. I think that's um, a very interesting overview. Uh, that you had there in terms of um, sort of the questions, the, the first one from me really. And so, Ajit, what, what's your sort of anticipation? Yeah, I'm sort of, I've heard varying numbers from zero to two percent. And what's your thoughts on, on any possible extensions to the current lockdown? I'll take the second part first. I mean, the lockdown is currently nationwide. But as I said, it looks like out of the 600 odd districts in India, 650 districts, it looks like uh, 60 to 70 districts, that is 10% of the districts are uh, much more vulnerable or what are called hotspots. So it is possible that the lockdown will be extended in, in those 60, 70 districts, uh, which includes essentially big cities like Mumbai and Delhi. Uh, but for the rest of the country, there will be a progressive relaxation. That's my expectation so that at least uh, many sectors can uh, resume operations, uh, production such as you know, uh, uh, chemical factories, textile, uh, coal mining, and uh, they of course restoration of uh, the, the logistics networks in terms of road and railways, uh, at least in in uh, in other parts of the country. Not all sectors will come on stream immediately, but certainly the essential goods and services on all their required supply chains and the input materials that industry will start. Uh, labor-intensive industries like textiles probably will give, get uh, get uh, priority, and progressively that's that's what I, I anticipate. As far as the GDP growth estimates are concerned, it's difficult to say because uh, uh, we can only build a scenario of uh, whether it will be a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery. But my feeling is that uh, given the uh, given the sort of large component of consumer uh in consumers in the economy and also the large uh, relatively large uh, portion of uh, government supported uh, relief uh, including in infrastructure and so on i still think that it's possible that india will have a uh, maybe a two to three percent gdp growth rate this year thank you very much for that i think that's a uh, yeah re really interesting obviously as you say there's so many different factors that, that need to be built in so it is almost impossible at the moment to sort of uh, to try to forecast on that. Uh, Jidesh, if I, I just come over to you, um, you mentioned in your presentation uh, some of the relaxation of, of some of the bureaucracy with obviously the ability to be able to to do webinars for, for board meetings and you know very much the, the push towards online uh, forms. Um, do you think that that will uh, continue post uh, COVID-19 because you know our ease of doing business survey shows that bureaucracy and legislation is still the biggest challenge in India. And obviously this is, um, you know, um, hopefully something positive that could come out of, of this crisis. Yes, um, thank you, Chris. Um, sure, I think uh, this is gonna remain. In fact, uh, the Chief Justice of India um, on uh, yesterday made a statement that uh, all technologies are gonna stay uh, I think this is also going to be the same with the executive, which controls the Ministry of Company Affairs, which is the regulator for companies. And uh, I am hopeful that uh, it will uh, continue and uh, uh, 
uh, I think this uh, would also mean uh, change in the way things are done in India. Perfect, thanks for that. We, we, we've got a question here coming from, from Sterling Smith. Um, I think the, the UK government has obviously announced significant package of stimulus. Um, you know, they've almost nationalised the workforce and the fact that anybody who isn't working, uh, the companies are able to apply for 80% of the salaries to be paid. Uh, but our understanding is, is that that isn't in place in, in India at the moment. But maybe, maybe to a question to Dilip. Uh, Dilip, what, what are you guys pushing for in terms of what you would like the Indian government to bring out um, and, and how quickly do you think that that will come into play? Miss the first part of what you actually asked uh, for. Can you just uh, repeat the first yeah, part so, of the question? Yeah, yeah. So, so we were talking about the, the UK government has obviously put a, a huge stimulus package in place. Uh, with the 80% payment of those workers who have been what, what the terminology is furloughed so essentially can't work so interesting to see from from Vicky's point of view what are you pushing for in terms of uh, the, the stimulus package for your members and uh, so what is the time frame that you think that there will be uh, additional measures in place so uh, we again I, like Ajit took the second part one uh, First, I'll also take the second part first. I believe that uh, maybe in the next two or three days, uh, maybe tomorrow or maybe day after, uh, you would see uh, some kind of a package uh, being uh, announced uh, in India. Uh, currently, the, the uh, package that has been announced in terms of payment support for workers is uh, limited uh, to you know companies having up to 100 employees with 90% of them actually having less than 15,000 rupees. And you know, if they are paying their uh, provident fund dues, then the, then the government meets uh, uh, the 24% of their provident uh, fund, right? So that is the only uh, kind of support uh, other than the waiver of, uh, uh, you know, uh, deferment of, of repayment of loans, et cetera, that has been talked about. So we expect, uh, you know, uh, industry has been saying that if you want to continue, uh, want us to continue paying people in a period of lockdown, uh, much more is required. In fact, uh, depending on the medium and small industries and the size they are, they are talking about two to three months of wages being given to them, uh, you know, uh, and the requests vary from a grant to a soft loan payable over three, uh, two to three years, right? So that is what the people are looking at in terms of uh, government support uh, to workers. But the bigger issue with workers and the slide with which uh, Ajit actually showed uh, among the migration pattern is that a lot of migrant workers have actually gone back to their homes. So, you know, the moment the lockdown kind of lifted, uh, how do you get, you know, do you have to run special trains or special transportation, buses, or whatever it is, to get the migrant workers back uh, to where they are uh, to be able to, you know, kickstart and start uh, industries? So that is the second uh, type of thing with, with, with regard to workers that they're looking for. And, and I think today uh, everybody believes, uh, you know, all the sectors believe that hopefully you know, the lockdown may be lifted partially in some areas by 15th this month. And for the areas that are open, then maybe there will be one type of support required. And the areas that are closed, I think the support required will be much more. So, um, you know, everything is kind of all the kind of packages and all are premised on the fact that we might get back to normal by 30th of June. But at this point of time, 100% of the economy getting back by 30th of June looks very, very unlikely. And you know, each of the different segments that are impacted differently would expect a different kind of a relief package uh, from uh, government for workers. I mean, you know, if you're going to close the hotels and uh, you know restaurants for beyond uh, two months, then they would require much more support. Uh, for example. So I think, uh, you know, as time uh, goes by uh, and depending on which sectors are hurting more, 
the request from government is going to change. So it's not a static request at this point of time. Yeah, no, that, 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 thanks very much for that. I think um, you know, that, that links into quite a lot of questions that we've actually had about um, you know, the labour uh, workforce obviously returning back to uh, their, their native places and obviously how that's going to kickstart you know once the the lockdown has been sort of uplifted uh one question we've got in here from from isaiah is asking about the the medical exports and whether you, uh, you feel as if there's going to be a relaxation on that um obviously the opportunity to export raw materials such as fabric um, is obviously a challenge and obviously that's needed vastly at the moment in, in sort of masks and gowns so i don't don't know Ajit, do you have any thoughts on whether there'll be any relaxation on the exports well, we just had the news item yesterday, right, uh, where there was a discussion about the export of hydrochloroquine, uh, which is, seems to be working in the treatment of COVID patients. So India just uh, relaxed, uh, I think, its export restrictions on this uh, dr a drug, this medicine, to many countries, include, including the US. Uh, it's a it's a bit tricky because uh, on one hand, as I said, the numbers in India are low right now. Uh, the total number of infected patients is 5,000, and uh, the you know the so number of people in ICUs or hospitalization is even smaller. So it's not clear how many patients, how many people are going to require. Uh, it's very difficult to predict, but the country has to keep ready stocks because uh, at short notice it's difficult to import. On the other hand, many of the India has been known as a as a strong player in pharmaceutical exports and pharma supplies, medical supplies. So in times like these, if the exporters do not service their clients' requirements, you know, uh, in times of need, uh, they may lose the, the relationship or the trust. So that's why it's a little tricky. Uh, yeah. The government had first put a lot of restrictions, but it looks like the government is taking a pragmatic way of selective relaxation on export uh, controls. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we've got uh, another question in here from, from David Landsman. Um, India already has an important position in the global pharma sector and some pioneering medical services, both physical and digital. Uh, are you likely to see opportunities for India in these areas after the crisis? Uh, so perhaps I can put that to you, Dilip. Yeah, so um, I think um, already uh, this uh, medical tourism was a big segment uh, in India. It kind of uh, took a backseat because now all the medical uh, facilities are uh, being used to address the domestic situation. The other aspect is that if we, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, the, to the previous point that, you know, we already are the largest uh, producer of uh, HCQ in the world, right? Uh, uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, being exported. Uh, but there's only a restricted ban in HCQ, so government-to-government -government deals are being done, but other deals are not being done. We look at uh, one of the things that I made, uh, and even uh, Ajit uh, talked about in his presentation, was realigning of the supply chains. So I think in the pharma uh, sector and in some critical medical equipment sector, and the, the government and many state governments have also announced packages in the middle of all of this to attract uh, medical equipment and the pharma API uh, production. So we expect that India would be a significant player going forward uh, in this, uh, in these segments. Thanks very much for that. And um, just a, a couple more questions. Hope everybody doesn't mind us slightly overrunning, but obviously this is such a, an interesting topic for everybody. Uh, one question that's come in from, from Dipanka and sort of links in nicely to a blog that I recently report, uh, wrote on the business process um, outsourcing um, sector in India and what the impact would be on that. Um, Judesh, if I could come to you, please. I think you, you mentioned there, uh, you know, cybersecurity being a huge challenge at the moment. Um, obviously, lots of people um, are, are very important workers working uh, for the telecommunication companies and, of course, working also for the banks providing that vital uh, infrastructure services for all the online support that we all uh, take for granted now. So Jidesh, what, what do you think is gonna be the sort of the impact on, on the BPO sector? Um, and how do you think the businesses are, are gonna be able to, 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 to look at that sort of cybersecurity issue? 
Chris, I'd like to come in after they show, uh, you know, after he answers, I'd like to come in on this. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Philip. Chiresh? Sure. Uh, the BPO sector in India can be uh, uh, can, um, can be put into uh, two or three different uh, slots. I think the first one is uh, BPO, which is providing um, uh, services uh, to essential commodity and goods companies in India, as well as those from outside the country. And second are those BPOs, which are not providing um, services to non-essential services and commodities uh, businesses in India, and uh, also international companies which are uh, operational in, in India. With respect to uh, companies which are providing uh, essential services in India, we see that uh, a lot of uh, people have been, a lot of companies have been permitted to operate uh, from their uh, um, offices. However, when it comes to work from home, the, the companies were not prepared. So I'd, I'd uh, certainly uh, uh, state that it's important for the companies to have such kind of policies in place. Uh, they had work from home policies, but uh, it did not, uh, it was not prepared uh, for um, an exercise of this magnitude. So I'd say that uh, it's important for the companies to really be ready and uh, also um, make it contractually more stricter because India's uh, data privacy laws uh, in the offing should probably be uh, coming out in the month in a month's time. And I think uh, once that comes into play, a lot more things will come into place. But uh, till such point in time, I still say that it's important to have very strong contractual uh, restrictions. Yeah, Chris, can I come in? Yes, please. Yes, if you can comment on that, Philip. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, so uh, what ni neither of us all uh, we missed out covering was that when this crisis hit, the first thing that the Ministry of Telecom and the government did was actually modify the order on other business services and allow them uh, the facility to work from home uh, without, you know, extensive permission. Uh, second, NASCOM actually came out with extensive protocols on how to ensure uh, security and how to actually uh, ensure that there's continuous, uh, you know, there is no breakdown in any service provided to any client anywhere in the world, whether in India uh, or anywhere in the world. And the third is that, uh, you know, uh, the government and the state governments are actually working to make that happen. So, you know, in some cases, you know, people need laptops uh, replaced and all. In Maharashtra, NASCOM actually tied up with the home guards uh, to deliver uh, laptops and other aspects. And the one message that, you know, India is sending out is in this whole thing of IT and ITS services, uh, we are sh uh, all actually working together across governments, across industry to ensure that there's no failure of delivering service to any client, whether in India or uh, anywhere in the world. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that. I think, uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to ask our, our, our last question now. Uh, and this has come from Sham, who heads up the West Midlands India Partnership. And um, he's asking about uh, the manufacturing sector. And sort of as we come out of, of COVID-19, uh, do you see an opportunity for India in terms of the Making India brand to sort of push? I think that globally there perhaps has been a, a realisation that uh, many supply chains are over-reliant on China. Um, and obviously there needs to be a rebalancing. Obviously there's a double-edged sword for that and the re over-reliance on India in terms of business process outsourcing. But I wonder if, from your point, Ajit, whether you think there's an opportunity for India uh, post COVID-19 and, and what sort of um, policies do you think India has to be putting in place now to sort of benefit from that? Oh, most certainly, Chris, uh, actually even before the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, because of, as a consequence of uh, the US trade, uh, US and China trade dispute, I think there's be, there were already a lot of companies uh, thinking about uh, some kind of a diversification uh, of uh, their production bases outside China. 
and there were many inquiries with India and some of them had progressed. So this was happening in any case. Uh, the second uh, factor which was helping this along was that China itself as a conscious industrial strategy is vacating the space of uh, low cost manufacturing. Uh, that is low cost meaning uh, labor intensive low cost manufacturing. So that's part of a national rebalancing strategy which has consequences of movement out of uh, China. And thirdly, because of COVID now, many people are going to have a fresh, different perspective. So because of all these three reasons, I think uh, anyway, there's going to be a migration away. And when it comes to uh, labor intensive sectors uh, like textiles, uh, chemi uh, leather, footwear, uh, agro processing, and also I would say tourism, which is not a manufacturing sector, it's a services sector, but it's a labor intensive sector. These are uh, uh, very high potential uh, sectors in India. And uh, a fourth factor, I would say, is India's own conscious moving away from the way Indian policymakers have thought about uh, global value chains and about uh, movement of uh, the supply chain uh, from countries which are part of free trade agreement. India has a free trade agreement with the ASEAN 10 countries, with China, sorry, with uh, Japan, South Korea, Singapore. Uh, what used to happen is that the earlier thinking was that if a commodity has to move across state borders, uh, country borders, it has to have significant value addition, rules of origin, uh, you know, requirements. But now I think there's an understanding that even if there are uh, value additions of four or five percent, so long as it's generating employment, it's very important to be part of uh, regional and global value chains. So the happy news, for example, is that a few just a few months ago. Uh, India reported an export of uh, some 100 or 200 million uh, mobile phones, which is which has happened after quite some time. Uh, those are, of course, uh, there's an assembly operation, and perhaps the electronics comes from Taiwan or Malaysia. So, if this is the trend, I think there is a tremendous scope for uh, relocation of manufacturing base into India. Thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any any time for any more questions. So apologies to, to anybody who put a question forward and, and we weren't able to get to, to that. Uh, just a reminder that this uh, session has been recorded and will be emailed out to everybody. Uh, we'll also put a, a notification and a, and a short blog up about some of the um, areas that we covered. Uh, our next uh, webinar is on the 16th of April and as I mentioned that's looking at university social responsibility and um, so those details will come up back. I think finally it's just just for me to thank uh, Ajit, Dilip and Jidesh for your time. I think it's been greatly appreciated um, and you know it was very much shown in terms of the high volume of people that we've had on this call was uh, how relevant and how important the, the topic is. I uh, will continue to do webinars um, um, in conjunction with FICI um, and obviously in conjunction with our members as well. So if there are any thoughts or any comments about topics that you would like us to cover, then please feel free to send us those via our Twitter handle at UKIBC, uh, via LinkedIn, via our group, or at my email is chris.hayes, that's H-E-Y-E-S, at UKIBC.com. Thank you everybody for your time, and I wish you a safe um, and onward day. And of course, uh, our thoughts and or with everybody at this moment to please all stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much.